So there's a scene in Frozen 2 where Olaf spouts a bunch of trivia and fun facts and some of them seem too good to be true. And when something seems too good to be true, it's good to put your cynical hat on and actually do some fact checking. Now this is one fact that Olaf says that's got like minor plot spoilers for Frozen 2, so if you're concerned about that, then spoiler warning for Frozen 2. Now on with Cynical Steph debunking Olaf from Frozen 2. So there are five pieces of information that Olaf says throughout the movie. First one is that men are six times more likely to be struck by lightning than women. Number two is gorillas burp when they're happy. Number three is wombats poop squares. Number four is that turtles can breathe through their butts. And then number five, which is the one that's mentioned the most times, is that water has memory. So Cynical Steph is going to go through each of these in turn and I've put the timestamps there in case you want to skip to a particular fact. So on with fact one. So are men six times more likely to be struck by lightning than women? So I dug into the numbers from the UK Tornado and Lightning Strike Research Organisation, TORO, and found that in the 25 years between 1988 and 2014, there were a total of 730 lightning strikes or in people struck by lightning. So roughly 30 people per year. Now the real life number for this might actually be quite a bit higher since, you know, indirect shocks or smaller shocks might not be reported or even sort of considered. Now surprisingly when I dug into the numbers, about half of all incidents happen indoors, which surprised me at first, but then actually back in the sort of 80s and 90s, every house had these ancient technologies called landlines that people would use quite a lot. Also, if you're ever near any sort of plumbing or, or metal outputs that went to the outside and you're inside the house when your house got struck, then chances are you might get a shock. So um, thinking about it a bit more, then it's not overly surprising overall. For just indoor strikes, there isn't that much of a disparity between men and women, but when you take outdoor strikes on their own, there is a big disparity between the number of males getting struck by lightning and females. In fact, 73% of people struck by lightning outdoors were male, meaning that 27% were female, which means that actually outdoors men are three times more likely to get struck by lightning than women are, which is pretty surprising. It's not quite the six that Olaf said. Now, this isn't to do with just men physiologically and women physiologically. What it is to do with is the amount of time men spend outdoors compared to women. Men take the majority of outdoor-based jobs such as farming or construction and even with indoor-based jobs men on average commute much further than women do. Women on average take much more of the caregiving duties which means they're much nearer their home or indoors most of the time. So this could go into a big discussion about uh, gender constructs and male and female roles within society and men putting themselves at risk by through the types of jobs that they have. I'm not going to go into that. Basically, Olaf was kind of half right. Outdoors only, men are much more likely to get struck by women. The numbers in the UK are three times more likely. Olaf said six. I think he gets half a point for that. Well done, Olaf. You were half right. Do girls burp when they're happy? So I find it really hard to get, you know, consistent peer-reviewed papers on this subject, but the fact that gorillas burp when they're happy is toted everywhere from National Geographic to BBC Earth to WTF facts. It seems to be everywhere, but I can't seem to find the original source for this fact. There is a term called belch localization, which is basically, you know, how I communicate after a big dinner. This type of communication between gorillas isn't actually burping, but it sounds an awful lot like it. Current evidence shows that this is a way that gorillas show that they are peaceful and not aggressive and to sort of uh, calm down angry gorillas. So this isn't a noise that they make when they're happy per se, but it is a sign that they are peaceful. I did also find a study that showed the amount of noises that gorillas make, not necessarily belching or burping noises, but uh, the amount that they were like enjoying the food, so with fruit and grubs and stuff, they made a lot more noises, which were both a sign of happiness, but also a communication to the gorilla family that there's good food there. Um, I know I make happy noises when I eat, so I totally relate to these gorilla guys. Gorillas! Gorillas! 
So was Olaf right? Do gorillas burp when they're happy? So I can't find the original source and as according to what I can see, it's not strictly true. They make burping sounds when they are showing signs of peace and very happy contented sounds when they're eating lots of nice food. But unfortunately, Olaf, no points for you. Oh, look at that. I've been impaled. So do wombats poop squares? Yes, they do. One point to Olaf. These cute, fluffy marsupials live in very dry parts of Australia and have really dry brick-shaped poops that they leave to mark their territory. Originally, biologists thought this nice square shape to help them, you know, pile up their poop more to make bigger markings of the territory. But I don't think this is true because they tend to just like poop and then pop. But one study of wombat's intestines actually showed that while other mammals' intestines kind of uh, expand in all directions pretty evenly, making nice round poop, wombats have ridges that expand more than the sides, making the kind of classic square shape. So the wombats wombling on the green leaf squares poop so that they can be seen. <laughs> Fact four, can turtles breathe out their butts? Yes, yes they can. Some hibernating turtles that uh, stay in ponds that freeze overnight can't come up to air to breathe into their lungs. And how they get oxygen is through lots and lots of blood vessels that are very near the skin. One particular area where these blood vessels are near the skin and can absorb oxygen is uh, around the butthole. So yeah, if you think that breathing is bringing in oxygen into the blood, then technically turtles breathe through their butts. I like it. One point to Olaf. And then finally, fact five, the one that Olaf touts everywhere, does water have memory? So memory could be described as retaining the information or influence of something after that thing that's creating that information has been entirely removed. Memory foam is called memory foam because when you take the weight that's compressing it off, you still have the divot where the weight was left. There's a slight memory of that weight being there compressing the, the foam. Now, water memory is this kind of philosophical idea that if you mix something into water, say, uh, salts or or some sort of bio biology uh, and then dilute it and dilute it until there's not one particle of that thing left in the water that the chemical composition of the water is somehow still retaining the memory of that thing once being in the water. This is this is the basis of a lot of homeopathic remedies and uh, philosophies about water memory and water being mystical and magical and there have been literally hundreds of tests of this, showing very, very inconclusive evidence. One paper that was actually published uh, showed evidence of it, but was could not be repeated at all. And after looking at it again, they realized that one of the people carrying out the tests was actually paid by a homeopathic remedy company and so probably had some sort of conflict of interest. And while they couldn't prove that he tampered with the evidence, there's a high chance that they may be dead. Olaf does actually say that this is highly contested by scientists and for a while it was, but since there has been no scientific evidence and no verification that water does hold memory and we've not been able to test it and study it and demonstrate it over and over, then we can just only conclude that that water doesn't have memory. Once you remove something entirely from water, it acts the exact same as when that water didn't have the stuff in it in the first place. So if someone offers you a homeopathic remedy saying that water does have this memory, tell them to go get verified, which is basically a scientific way of tell them to get to. Now, some types of materials do exhibit a special type of memory called hysteresis. This is when the properties of that material are dependent not only on the conditions of the material right now, but what the material was experiencing before it got to this point. Take magnetic hysteresis, for example. If you take any magnet without sort of memory in it and put it in an electric field, it will exhibit a certain type of magnetism. 
Now, no matter what the electric field is or what it's been in the past, you can plot this magnetism on a graph and it will make a line. Maybe the line is steeper or shallower depending on the material. Maybe it's a weird shape like an S or a curve, but it means that no matter what conditions you put this under an electric field, it will always have the same magnetic properties. With magnetic memory or hysteresis, this isn't the case. Magnets that have this type of magnetic memory are called ferromagnets and when you put them in an electric field their properties are dependent on whether they are charging or discharging. So when you're charging up a ferromagnet it might take one plot but then if it was charged in the past and then it's at that same electric field as before then it will have a different type of magnetic property. Ferromagnets are actually used in all sorts of computing applications for hard disk memory because they do actually exhibit this kind of physical memory property. So if I'm going to fully fact check Olaf, then I really should check to see whether water is ferromagnetic. And the answer is no. Water is about as far from a ferromagnet as possible. It is slightly dielectric, which means that in an electric field, instead of being positively charged like most magnets will be, it will be slightly negatively charged and repel magnets. It's this diamagnetic effect that's allowed us to like levitate frogs and stuff in strong electric fields. So we understand the magnetic properties of water pretty well and they definitely don't exhibit memory. So, so unfortunately, no matter how I tackled it with water memory and material memory, uh, unfortunately, Olaf was wrong. Water, uh, certainly in our world, doesn't have memory. So out of a total of five facts, Olaf got two and a half correct. He was halfway there. Then again, he's a talking snowman, so maybe you shouldn't take everything he says so literally. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this Cynical Steph special episode of Science with Steph. If you did, please give it a like and share it with your friends. If you want to not miss my next upload, then make sure you subscribe and hit that bell. In the meantime, if you want to watch uh, my last episode, you can click here, which was a special collaboration with Wilf from Wilf Wonders. And if you want to watch the video that the YouTube algorithm thinks you'll enjoy best, you can click down here. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Thanks, bye.